Hi there guys, Alex Woods here, reporting from the Middle Temple, Inns of Court in central London. And I'm posting on this rather important 10 days in the life of Redwood Legal and the life of me as a solicitor and the life of my business project, bringing claims on behalf of consumers against banks for the mis-selling of financial product, uh, products. And uh, what I'm majoring on today is, of course, the claims that we've been running in respect of offers that have previously been made and money that's been paid to consumers, in some cases over a year ago, which we say are inadequate. We say these PPI uh, refunds, handouts that have been made by banks are, inadequ are inadequate, and we say that they're inadequate because they only, in certain cases, not all, but in the cases that we're running, they only include a simple 8% interest and not compound and we say compound is appropriate where the consumer had high cost of borrowing a credit card no less with the same lender who missold the PPI on their loan they were struggling under high borrowing costs on their credit cards and therefore simple 8% is not appropriate so uh, I'm going to focus in this posting on four key criteria or considerations that uh, consumers and this is also aimed at lawyers out there should have in mind before they embark upon the somewhat time-consuming and uh, potentially costly exercise of bringing a claim against a financial institution because you don't think that they've paid you enough right so uh, the, the first thing to say is uh, before I get into the meat of these four points, is that over the last 10 days, we have had, I mean, it's probably been the busiest period in my career, actually. I've had four trials. I've just come out of a telephone uh, hearing, which we won, fortunately, in uh, One Essex Court here, the chambers that I regularly use. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about the trials and the hearings that we've had over the past 10 days and basically we've had two key uh, strikeout applications in two of our we're calling them true loss or additional refund claims and uh, I'm also going to touch on a couple of claims that uh, we've been forced to settle and I'm going to also going to mention a really rather interesting claim that took place in Milton, uh, Milton Keynes County Court last week a full trial so, I mean, we've had trials and hearings coming out of our ears over the past 10 days. So, you know, keep uh, your ears peeled. Uh, don't tune into another internet channel because it's, it's all going down here on Redwood Legal, cartoonbankers.com. Uh, I'll allude to these cases as I go through the key, the, these key four points. So, uh, the first thing to say is that uh, it's really important uh, that you can demonstrate to your bank uh, and then to a court if your bank doesn't listen to your complaint that uh, if you'd had that money that the bank has deprived you of respect of the sums you've been paying each month to the the loan repayment those that part of the monthly repayment in respect of the PPI loan uh, it's important for you to demonstrate that had you got that money in your hands at that time you would have used that money to reduce other higher costs of borrowing uh, and we say in these cases invariably that let's say a consumer uh, might have had 50 or 100 pounds that he was paying each month to the PPI loan he could have used that to reduce his credit card and now everybody in this day and age uses credit cards and uh, people who borrow money from banks and who have loans often use credit cards more than others. Uh, and the, so it's important that you demonstrate that you would have actually have used that money. So you want to be able to show to the bank or the court that you, know, you had a high, you were struggling in respect of your debts. And that had you got the money, you would have used it to reduce uh, a credit card balance or an overdraft on a current account it was also earning uh, the bank compound interest. Don't forget that the bank is 
uh, actually giving you uh, uh, borrowing facilities, uh, one borrowing f facility on a fixed term loan, and another borrowing facility in respect to your credit card, and they're charging you high levels of compound interest on your credit card, but they're only giving you back your PPI refund on a simple, not compound, 8% and not 20, 25% uh, interest basis. So anyway, that's the first thing to note. Now, uh, that was a consideration in one of these four cases, not the ones that went to trial, but ones that we had to settle against Barclays. And I felt I had to settle because I had the, con the consumer in my offices taking a witness statement from him and ultimately he's, he, did, he, he didn't say that had he had the money he would have used it to reduce other debts, other borrowings. Uh, and he especially didn't say that he would specifically use the money to reduce the credit card that he had with the same bank. Um, so that's, you know, that's a case that we had to settle and take a hit on. Um, so, uh, by the way, no cost to the client. These cases are being largely, if not entirely, funded by Redwood Legal. And, and also, uh, most of them have been on the small claims track, some of them are on the small claims track, uh, such that even if we were to win, we wouldn't get uh, our legal bill paid by the other side. So it's something of an investment for us as a business, um, and something of uh, you know, a speculative enterprise, I suppose you'd say. So that's the first thing. The second thing to note is that um, this is you know, really uh, something that it's an, it's an X factor. And that is that a judge might conclude that he's not comfortable with you coming back for a second bite at the cherry. Oliver Twist coming back to the head table and asking for more. Okay, now that's something of an irrational point. One district judge, perhaps the old, older judges who don't so much like the, cons the consumer credit regime, but that's probably an ages statement. But, but uh, uh, some judges are perhaps rather than age, who might be a little bit fixed in their ways, might not like the idea of you coming back for an additional refund where the bank has already sent you out uh, a has already settled your address sometimes as I say as long as a year ago. Now this is uh, relevant in uh, the case this is relevant in the case where we had a two and a half strike out application uh, on Wednesday because the judge in passing wouldn't form part of her judgment but she kind of couldn't help but mention it said that you know what I'm even though the offer that Lloyd's made to your client uh, didn't say this is in full and final settlement of your claim, even though it said that, uh, even though it didn't say that, sorry, I feel there's been a valid compromise, it's the legal word, a valid compromise of your claim and therefore uh, the legal principle of res judicata or valid compromise or merger these are all clever terms, technical terms, for not being allowed to have two bites of the cherry where this issue has already been a compromise or has already been reached. Um, so even though it didn't have full and final settlement in the, in the letter, I'm still not going to, you know, take, take your claim seriously. So that's something that, that a district judge, for example, if you were to find yourself in court, they may take that you. So, uh, and, and the, the, the flip side of that actually, and I now allude to another case that I uh, settled, and I settled this case, uh, and, and I settled it on a drop hands basis, so we both walked away, both parties walked away, the consumer got nothing, the bank, uh, you know, got nothing, each party bore their own legal costs, that's what drop hands means. Um, in that case, it transpired quite late in the day. Uh, we had disclosure of the fact that my client had had that the bank had written off the loans a lot, many years previously. Possibly had sold them to another company, a debt purchaser, 
uh, and also had charged off, written off a uh, reasonably substantial overdraft on a current account. And so for all these sorts of reasons, they had almost had a counterclaim against our claim for additional compound interest that in effect meant that, the, that it was pointless expending money on lawyers and court fees and etc taking this thing to trial when at the old at the end of the day my client was going to get pennies out of the deal if they won uh, the other side you know likewise so uh, that's um, that that case we, we settled for that for those reasons but the reason I I mention it because in that case uh, against um, against Barclays there was a full and final settlement but but uh, although that full and final settlement term appeared in the letter uh, the fact is that we thought that because the banks had been quite uh, heavy-handed in dealing with the complaint because they'd actually told our client this is the sum of money that you're going to get because they actually unilaterally set it off against uh, the the debt the client had on on loan um, because they just sent out a check because the client was in financial difficulties didn't really understand compound interest as opposed to simple interest kind of all those reasons I thought that we had a reasonably strong case to say even where full and final settlement had been uh, uh, stated by the banks and uh, the consumer had accepted that, uh, you could reopen that agreement and have two bites of the cherry. So as I say, I, I give those two cases as examples of, of, of the fact that there are vagaries involved and that uh, you know, where you've already had the matter settled, it might be that a judge may find against you. The key here is if you feel you have been ripped off, if you feel you've been shortchanged, if you feel there's some lack of fairness, equity, uh, lack of justice in, in the original arrangement, in the original offer. So that's the second point uh, to, to take away from these hearings that we've had this week. Uh, I think uh, probably the, the, the third uh, key area is the th I think the th probably the third key area is that uh, and this is a positive you can take away from the hearings that we've had over the past week I should explain in one case our claim was struck out in the other case uh, the claim continues uh, one thing to to remember generally about these types of cases is that if you can bring the unfair relationships test as a head of claim against a bank uh, which is a bit of legislation under the Consumer Credit Act if you can rely on an unfair relationships test head of claim then that gives you a great advantage a great advantage now in not all cases for reasons to do with limitations act um, fulfilling the requirements uh, that the loan completed it at a certain time that uh, the loan commenced at a certain time the various criteria but basically uh, an unfair relationships test claim that the loan must have completed after April 2008. Um, it's slightly more complicated than that. That's a good yardstick. And if your, you know, if your loan is still current, then you will probably be able to avail yourself of the unfair relationships test. Now, this is a bit of legislation that's really quite radical, and it really is something that the banks are afraid of. And I'm just going to touch on. Uh, another trial we had on Friday in which we had felt we had a reasonably weak case but it was on the small claims track and so we felt that even if we lost we wouldn't have to pay the other side's fees and we felt strongly about the case we, we felt strongly about the client with whom we traveled uh, a long road with and she was really pissed off about having been sold a PPI product on her credit card by MBNA and uh, so we decided to go to trial and reject a low offer of settlement from the other side. And it was really surprising because she simply stated again and again and again in open court, in cross-examination, 
I didn't want it. You stuck it on, I didn't want it, I didn't want it. Now, typically, before the Unfair Relationships Test Consumer Credit Act 1974, as amended, had been invented, people had to rely on things like breach of contract or misrepresentation or breach of statutory duty. These are like the gateways through which I'm afraid you have to go through in order to bring a case in the courts and get, get, it, get it in front of the judge. You have to plead the, the right gateway to go, to go through. Now, um, the, un the judge at the beginning of that trial said, <laughs> the first thing he said was, my God, I was around when the consumer credit was enacted and I, I felt it was a big mistake that Parliament ever then amended the Consumer Credit Act and created this thing called the Unfair Relationships Test. He was a slightly older judge. It was quite funny to see him express his views in that way when he was meant to be impartial. But interestingly, our barrister did an excellent job in his first trial. And by the end of the trial, three, three, three four hour trial, the judge was actually saying, hmm, hang on, there's something in this. Because the unfair relationships test puts the burden on the lender to prove, if you make an allegation of unfairness, such as a mis-selling of a PPI product, to prove that, that, it, that, that they you know, acted fairly. And in the case of this MBNA credit card, even though there were strong arguments to say the client should have seen the PPI on their credit card, it kind of acquiesced to it, left it on there for years, hadn't mitigated their loss by cancelling it earlier, the simple fact of it was that the client said she didn't want it and it was stuck on without her permission. Um, so judgment has been reserved, which means uh, the judge is going to hand down judgment in a couple of weeks' time, so I can't give you the results of that case. But it certainly give, given MBNA, and they turn up in force at the trial, by the way, people from the office, not just their lawyers, it's given them a bit of a scare, I dare say, and I'm rather glad that we run that case, even though it's uh, costing the firm money. Uh, but what, what the, point, the point that I'm, I make really is that this is even where um, your lawyers may be telling you that you haven't got a case because you can't get yourself through one of these gateways, these legal gateways. If you really feel strongly that you've been wronged, shortchanged, ripped off, uh, not pro you, that you, you, you've given, been given some money and it's to rise or offered to make you go away. You can, you can uh, if you, the unfair relationships test is a powerful piece of legislation, basically. And the, the, the direction, um, long term, the, you know, the way the wind is blowing is in support of the consumer, the protection of, of the consumer. So uh, I mentioned uh, four things, four things to take away from the, uh, from the trials and the hearings that we've, that we've had over the past 10 days. I mentioned the fact that you need to demonstrate causation, uh, that the bank contributed to your loss, that, that you would have used that money to reduce higher borrowings on typically a credit card. I've also mentioned that, uh, you know, that uh, full and final settlement is tricky. You've got to be careful about the two bites of the cherry argument. It can cut um, both ways and that there may have been a, you know, a valid compromise of the claim. And uh, of course I've also mentioned that uh, one of the, uh, the you know, th th that the unfair relationships test is a bit of le le legislation that uh, consumers you know, really can and should uh, try and rely on. And it's something that the banks you know, are very uh, afraid of indeed I would say and uh, the, the fourth thing I would say is that uh, you've got to carefully lay out your the facts uh, behind your claim you've got to actually properly the technical word is particularize your claim um, now that touches on uh, the other the, the big issue really was that it, obviously in these cases we had an admission from the banks that in some cases that the PPI was unsuitable for the client's needs sometimes the, the, the letters from the bank said this is a goodwill gesture but along with the check that they sent the consumer they invariably mentioned the fact that they imp implied that they had missold the PPI 
So we didn't think that this would be uh, too insurmountable a hurdle and that the judge would take a view and uh, accept that as admissible evidence and therefore we wouldn't have to particularise our liability. In short, uh, the fourth point is that you do have to prove your claim afresh. You kind of do have to in, uh, start uh, from scratch and prove all over again that you were missold the PPI, even though you're just bringing a claim uh, about inadequate quantum, you can't rely on the bank's payout admission uh, if, when it comes to court. You can uh, use it in evidence, and it will be good evidence that the bank did missell this product, but it won't get you across the finishing line. So there it is, as the rain now starts to fall on a rather muggy, uh, Friday afternoon, September the 19th, uh, I shall close this video bulletin. But uh, do stay tuned because we have a few more of these cases, a few more of these hearings coming up in the autumn. So I'll post, if not in two weeks, perhaps in a month's time. Okay, uh, that's all for now. And, you know, please stay tuned in with cartoonbankers.com.